Hi, I'm Eric, uh, and I'm part of the crisis response team. Best job I think I could ever have here. Uh, and uh, the crisis response team is interested in helping communities uh, prepare for, respond to, and rebuild from humanitarian disasters. And that could be a natural disaster, it could be other other types of disasters. Definitely needed service. Uh, I think so. And growing over time as we kind of uh, see what's going on with climate change, for example. More storms and more severe storms, and these are the types of things that drive a lot of our incident response activities. Awesome. Yeah, well you want to take us through some of that so we can get a better sure. understanding of it? Sure. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, one of our primary uh, uh, missions here is incident response. So you might see a lot of connectivity options. You might see our emergency response vehicle over here, satellite kits, uh, connectivity solutions. Uh, these are all kind of a core mission uh, as we are requested for service uh, by different uh, uh, nonprofit partners, uh, state, uh, local, national government things of that nature. Uh, we're interested in assisting with connectivity solutions uh, because connectivity is becoming a requirement for the modern day, right? Think about if you are escaping a disaster, you'll want to tell your family that you're safe. Uh, you will want to tell them that I'm going to a certain location as a next step, and so these are the types of activities that we engage in primarily. However, we are also uh, interested in sharing our technology solutions uh, as well as assist uh, other organizations, whether they're a customer or not, uh, with capacity building so that we enable a more effective response globally. Uh, and we provide so, this at zero cost. I'm sorry, go ahead. Awesome, awesome, Eric. Yeah, so just to kind of cap off on that, um, it's a lot more than just a vehicle, right? Crisis response is not just what you see in there, it's more of an all-encompassing service, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's a program, uh, it's a certain set of skills, right? Uh, and uh, and it's having that, that know-how and speaking the language of crisis response globally. Uh, we're one of the few organizations at Cisco that actually deploys these types of products, connectivity solutions, cloud solutions uh, in very austere environments. And so we like to share our experiences with internal teams, any external entities that want some assistance and wants assistance in designing uh, their own solutions. Absolutely. Awesome, awesome. You want to show us a little bit more into maybe some of the transit cases and, and some of these um, connectivity solutions? Sure, have in yeah, the absolutely. Here we've got just a few examples of some kits. Uh, so here on the left is PK, Phone Kit 100. Here on the right, RRK100. Uh, forgive the tactical operation stickers. That was the old name for our team, and uh, we are in the process of rebranding. In the kits themselves, you'll see that there's documentation that includes a concept of operations, right? So we'll a business case on why we actually design Conops. Very, very military. It, it is a little military, and uh, we're changing some of the nomenclature around. I mean, I like it because I was in the Air Force, and I used to deploy tactical networks too, so it definitely resonates with me. Well, it makes sense <laughs> that you're interested in this because that type of background does attract uh, folks. I'm uh, I'm a veteran army guy myself. Thank you for your service. Oh, thank you for your service, right? Um, please never say that again. <laughs> uh, but these kits we've built to achieve certain mission objectives. Uh, with a phone kit, uh, which we drive from WebEx Calling, it's a public cloud service over the top. As long as we can establish some sort of a backhaul connection, we can have an emergency operations center, right? Right, and so that backhaul connection will be like through satellite in, in a uh, disaster scenario, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we can use satellite, uh, we can use cellular connectivity, wireline services, which we will then feed into typically a next generation firewall. And that could be an MX appliance that we've got here in the uh, rapid, uh, re rapid response kit. Thank you, excuse me. RRK is the rapid response kit. This is indicative of kind of a small form factor kit, packs into a very tiny case, suitcase sized, uh, and that uh, it essentially is, uh, is um, our idea of uh, a fast response is sometimes better than a gigantic response that is, you know, a week delayed, right? Right, right. I'm also kind of putting this together in my head, like you guys could deploy the vehicle as your floor, right? And then you could expand off of that vehicle, right? Connecting these smaller units back through this vehicle's connectivity as well. Could you yeah, absolutely, Jacob. Now, one kit that we typically will pair with the vehicle is the mesh response kit over here in the corner. Mm. We can maybe we walk go take that a look way. at it. Yeah.
Excuse us, guys. That's amazing. Especially for like. So this kit uh, is uh, four outdoor access points. The model numbers change over time as we continue to refresh the equipment. Um, with just the access points alone, we're able to set up a larger scale uh, mesh uh, Wi-Fi environment, uh, something that could cover a high school parking lot, for example. Oh, wow, nice. To give everyone wireless LAN access. Yep, absolutely. These are like semi-ruggedized, but this would still need to be indoor or under a, a, some type of cover, right? It it looks like it's not ruggedized, but these are typically IP67 rated. Oh, wow. okay. uh, so they, they may not be ruggedized oh, yeah, for thing, industrial <laughs> this use. This thing is heavy. <laughs> uh, indeed, and uh, I know that I've used this kit in particular to support a point of distribution exercises uh, with county emergency management, management uh, teams. And uh, we'll stand the injector. The PoE injector, right? Uh, so imagine uh, we might have a base station here with a root uh, mesh, uh, and we might have some of these uh, other uh, access points deployed on masts, powered by maybe a hand portable UPS uh, with just the injector. Awesome. Yeah. It's cool to be able to visualize how all this stuff interconnects. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've got some photos if you want to have a look. Maybe we can take a look at the uh, truck. System. Hey, yeah, let's check it out. All right. All right, this is cool being inside the truck here. Yeah, I think it's an incredible environment. It's a little tight, uh, not quite as uh, expansive as the last one, which included a conference room, if you recall correctly, uh, in the back of the vehicle. Oh, yeah, I do recall that now. Uh, it was a little bit of an H HVAC load uh, issue, and uh, so we, we shortened it up uh, significantly, and I think that this is still applicable uh, maybe that conference room is a bit of a luxury, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is pretty cozy in here. I actually feel comfortable in these type of environments. I guess it goes back to my military days. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> now, I mean, primarily, we're, we're here to have equipment to you know, do a lot of the heavy work. But we do have three operator stations, uh, IP telephony deployed here. Um, this is a little incomplete, I'll be honest. Uh, we just received the truck recently. And Didn't you say like four days ago or something? Yes, just a few days ago, absolutely. Uh, so it took a little while. This was a year and a half in the making, uh, but we did our best at uh, plugging in as much equipment as possible to show that you know we've got a full solution here. Awesome. Yeah, it's cool seeing this. And it's funny we were talking about the old nerve, right? And you guys have the pictures up here. Look, old nerve, which we did a previous or previous video of. So yes, yeah, so totally cool to see the nerve 2.0. Oh yeah, nerve 2.0. Uh, it's, uh, I think, a big advancement in uh, and kind of a mobile command center style vehicle and uh, really demonstrates our commitment to assisting with uh, crisis communications, which frankly is, uh, is a requirement nowadays, right? Yep, absolutely. And so on this wall over here, JC, if you want to pan. So on this wall over here, we've got quite a few different pieces of hardware, right? Looks like we've got some LAN switching, you have some patch panels up there, you got some radio equipment, probably got your firewalls and everything up in there too as well, I presume. Looks like maybe you got some servers, little UCS servers. Uh, looks like it's a, a little mini data center, but it's got a lot more stuff than you would normally see, especially here on this radio side, right? Yeah, the radio side, I mean, we've typically maintained a, a considerable complement of UHF and UHF radios, as well as ham radios, uh, to make sure that we're communicating with our emergency management partners. Uh, we've got some radio interop solutions, although the calls for those types of missions have been fairly rare. Uh, and then at the upper right side of it, you see a uh, direct TV receiver. So oh, right, right. I'll make that comment earlier. It's like probably even cable TV. And yeah, you bring, cable TV. bring a cable TV feed through the truck. That's right. Uh, unfortunately, we can't get our satellite connectivity or as far as uh, cable TV goes uh, in, in the uh, convention center here. Uh, so we've got uh, the 80s TV channel and so forth. Oh, yeah, I see, I see. Cool. That's the example there. Yeah. Uh, indeed. But on the uh, the IT equipment side on the left, uh, we've got uh, a lot of Meraki equipment, uh, which we use uh, uh, fairly broadly across the uh, across the board for uh, edge and access layer connectivity. Is there any reason, Eric, why you guys chose to put the Meraki in the trunk rather than traditional cameras? Um, we did it uh, because this. Uh, set of switches. These are replaceable. These are MS250s stacked. Uh, they will be replaced soon with MS390s and that I believe represents a convergence between catalysts. That's the new, yeah, the new model, right? The new model with the catalyst where you could switch either side, right? You can turn it into a catalyst or register it to the cloud. 
Right. Uh, in fact, uh, I don't know if you've gone to any of the sessions that talk about some of the catalyst Meraki convergence, um, but yeah, there is a significant amount of effort to, to allow for different modes of operation between these. But for us, the MS390 represents not only performance, M-Gig capability, speeds and feeds, but also some, some cybersecurity uh, features such as uh, uh, scalable group tags uh, to allow us to segment traffic a little better. Um, but we also have uh, some Meraki firewalls as well um, and uh, Meraki access points. You can see tucked in there on the left side of the rack. Too cool, Eric. Too cool. Well, I think you've pretty much brought us through all the key points and features of the Cisco Response Vehicle. I've got a couple of more. You got a couple more. Oh, uh, please you, do share. If you wouldn't allow me to <laughs> belabor the point just a little bit longer, uh, we have some uh, some equipment that may not may not be uh, familiar to to many of your viewers. So, in addition to the Meraki networking equipment that we've got in the top, uh, of course, our satellite equipment here. But we also have the industrial router 8340. Um, this is a little bit of a unique device, and forgive the missing blanking adapters here, uh, but we've got uh, uh, this unique timing module. Uh, this is going to serve as the NTP reference for the rest of the infrastructure within the vehicle. That is the NTP server, Network Timing Protocol server, right? Sure. Yes, absolutely. Um, some of the other stuff does not provide that, uh, so that's a critical function for us. Um, as well as the, uh, the modularity of the, the chassis allows us to uh, provide connectivity options other than Ethernet, right? So we could have T1s, E1s, DSL, right? And yeah, when you name it, right? Absolutely. And when 6G comes out, and 7G and 8G, it's just a module change at that point. And one of the reasons for this, right, is because you're in in different situations and environments where you want to be able to accept whatever the local service providers have, right? To be able to take connectivity into the truck. That's right. We can't dictate where the crisis is and what capabilities exist within the area. We just need to try to plug in as, right, right. Got as it. rapidly as possible. One other thing that may be worth mentioning is that these do have a microservices hosting capability and we will use it uh, for this next set of, uh, of appliances here. Uh, so here we have the Cisco HyperFlex Edge short servers. Ah, that's what those are. Yes, right. So these are specialized C-series servers, if you will. Uh, and with the short designation, uh, that dictates that they are only about 24 inches short, if I recall correctly, as well as all of the disk and I.O. and power supply access being from the front. So that's pretty atypical. Uh, yeah, that's very atypical, yeah. yeah. Normally all these, all the NICs you see here, yep, and the power adapters are all in the back. And normally you're right, like any of these style of servers are really long and cumbersome. That's one thing I always liked about working on networking equipment rather than working on server equipment is because you can install a switch by yourself. Um, or, you know, with the server, if you can't do it by yourself, you just got to put the rails on, just much more cumbersome to, to get them in the rack. Yeah, you know what, you're making me remember the nightmares of uh, me trying to rack DL380s all by myself as a, <laughs> as, as a young deployment engineer. Um, but uh, one of the things that uh, I wanted to mention is that this is a two-node edge cluster, and typically you need a third device to prevent a split brain operation whenever uh, they lose connectivity with each other or some other problem arises. Um, now, in the case where we have connectivity, our silent witness is provided by the InterSight cloud platform. Um, but if we yeah. ever don't have connectivity, well, the, the intent is to use the routing appliance uh, and its local microservices container. Uh, we've got a, um, a uh, silent or a third watcher, if you will. So we can be a silent witness, I think is what the proper product term is, for this pair of servers. Awesome, awesome. Really cool breakdown. Thank you so much. Certainly, okay. really, certainly. Really cool. And if you'd like to see one other thing, the coolest features in oh, the back. All right. Hey, yeah. yeah. Bring us on back. Shall we break? Yeah, okay, let's, let's go. That. So, Jacob, the one thing that I wanted to share with you, and I don't know if you happen to see any of Chuck Robbins' uh, kickoff this morning, uh, but he talked about sustainability and talked about our CSR goals, right? Uh, and so there's some applicability here because we've taken that um, kind of corporate focus and we've introduced that into our requirements for our systems integrators. We have an 85 kilowatt hour battery supply or power supply in here delivered by uh, four banks of batteries and uh, that's more than most electric vehicles. Mm. Right? So we've got that dedicated to our IT workload. Yeah, that's to, to run your basically data center in the truck, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and so this allows us to potentially run missions uh, with zero greenhouse gas emissions, Wow. right? 
Um, I think that that's the, the very forward looking. That is, yeah. That's uh, awesome. And awesome to see this kind of technology making it into to this kind of stuff. Oh yeah, and whenever we do uh, exhaust our battery capacity and drop down to 10%, the system will automatically call out to our power takeoff generator in the front of the truck. Uh, will uh, power the batteries or try to charge them as fast as possible. Via gas, via the engine running, to charge the battery system. Right, exactly. It's via diesel in this particular case. And, um, well, you know, that's uh, not necessarily as sustainable as not running a diesel engine. It is running at its peak output, and so we turn it off as soon as we can once the batteries reach their 90% threshold. Awesome. Yeah, it's really cool to see. Like, you can survive through most any situation with this thing. I think the only thing you can do to make it better is give it wings and maybe turn it into a boat. But other than that, you know. <laughs> other than that, maybe add a microwave to it. <laughs> 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 and But hey, speaking on this subject too, you know, um, you guys have a big volunteer team, right? For the crisis response? Yeah, absolutely. We wouldn't be able to do our job without our volunteer crisis response community. Awesome. How many volunteers do you guys have that help with this kind of stuff? Uh, globally, I believe we have about 400 volunteers, um, and we're always looking for more, to be honest. Hey, you hear that? If you want to volunteer for a good cause, you can actually help out with this whole stuff. When there's a disaster, I would presume that these folks would be able to deploy to that disaster zone to help set up the comms, right? That's what the volunteering is about? Or, or I'm assuming there's other roles, too, outside of engineering. Uh, there absolutely are. I mean, we're running a number of projects and they are, some of them are related to data and management and reporting, uh, cybersecurity. Uh, we don't have all of the skills in-house that maybe Cisco IT does, right? So we depend on some volunteers for specific expertise as well as their physical presence and primarily their willingness to get involved. I think that's the most important thing and that's the highest hurdle to cross. So if you're interested and internal, uh, please ping me uh, or look for the crisis response community on SharePoint and help us out. Just raise your hand and see if you're willing to uh, assist in humanitarian crisis response. Uh -huh. We couldn't do what we've done in Europe without you, uh, assisting uh, the Ukrainian refugees. So thank you for anybody that's out there. Yeah, that'd be an amazing service, right? And so if you're thinking about, if you have that itch or that you know thing calling out to you, like, hey, I need to give back a little bit. Well, eventually you do need to do that in your life. And this is one way you can do it. This is one way you can use your existing skills, knowledge as an engineer, knowledge in IT to help out. Who knows? Apply and check it out. We'll get, we'll get a, if you have a link or something, we can share that or um, some way for folks to apply. That would be good. Awesome. I'll definitely provide you so that you could uh, get it in the show notes, right? That's always what it is. Uh, check yep, out the yep, show notes, right? Yep, we'll do that. Okay. Well, awesome, Eric. Hey, thank you so much again for this amazing tour of everything. Also talking with us about the volunteer services. You know, everybody's going to be able to more clearly understand what Cisco's crisis response is all about and the need for that in the world. So thanks awesome. again. Thank you, Jacob. Yes, sir. Jacob Hess here. Thank you for watching the video. I hope you really enjoyed it. And I'd also like to remind you, if you're truly serious about your career in information technology, then be sure to check out our IT engineer training programs at www.zerotoengineer.com.